Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, several big things have happened in the last couple of days. I woke up this morning uh, to see exactly 400,000 subscribers here on the channel. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I cannot say that enough for this incredible community that continues to grow. Uh, congratulations to my friend, Mr. Terry, who hit 400,000 just a couple of days ago. Had to beat me to it, jerk. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, and I'm going to be appearing uh, on his charity stream tomorrow night. Speaking of streams, uh, we're going to be doing one here on the channel today, 5 p.m. Eastern, a celebration of 400,000. Do some Q&A, play some games. I really have no idea what we're going to do. We're just going to have fun interacting. So that was one thing. Second thing that happened over the weekend is my Rangers in Scotland. The team from Glasgow won the Scottish Cup for the first time in, I think, like 20 years. They have the most Scottish Cups, but it's been a while since they won one. Their friends over at Celtic across town in Glasgow have been winning them all. So excited for that. That's why I'm wearing the, the jersey today. And the other thing that happened, you all started letting me know last night, was that Sam Onella released a new video. Now, typically, my policy is to wait the better part of a week, typically, to uh, give a video a chance to get views before I do a reaction. But in unique cases, Sam Onella oversimplified really big channels that people all watch like instantly when they come out uh i'll make an exception to that so i didn't do it last night i waited until today hopefully you've all already watched the video if you haven't please check it out check out some of his other stuff warning up front to those of you concerned about such things his videos are not typically family friendly so just be aware of that they are very entertaining and very interesting and full of great information. So this one is Presidential Pets, A Brief History. I'll put the link down in the description to the original content. Definitely check him out. Good stuff. Let's dive in. Hey, adults. So most of us are aware of it. <laughs> So he says, hey, adults. I think typically he says, hey, kids, but uh, I, I get why he had to do that. In fact, let's see what he flashes up on the screen here. Hey, adult. So he, he got dinged for saying that. And this is one of the things people don't realize about making content on YouTube is that you have to be careful about everything you say, especially at the beginning of a video. There are reasons why myself and others will say things like the guy with the silly, the Austrian with the silly mustache instead of saying his name. Or I will use the term national socialism instead of saying what most people called them, even though really they weren't socialist uh, by the time you get into the 1940s, especially uh, because there are certain buzzwords that tend to get YouTube's attention and not in a positive way. So we have to be careful. So most of us are aware of at least one animal companion to the commander in chief. All but three presidents have owned some kind of pet during petless virgins. We've got James Polk. Andrew Johnson, a.k.a. Tommy Lee Jones, and a very strange version of Donald Trump. Interesting. In their term, and there's good reason for that. Not only does a lovable mutt serve to humanize an otherwise larger-than-life figure, but their cute antics can also be a great distraction when needed. Huh? Drone strikes? Never heard of her. Hey, we're doing a photo op with this dog that shares a name with my vice president's son, because, you know, that's not weird at all. But as it turns out, dogs and cats are just the tip of the iceberg. There have been a lot of quadruple- Obviously, the best pet we're going to talk about is Andrew, Johnson, er, Andrew Jackson's parrot, and you cannot possibly- go wrong with saying that was the best presidential pet. Beetle occupants of the White House, even without Miss Lewinsky. So today we'll be going through just a few of the more interesting ones. Going back to the beginning, Washington and critters galore, including four black and tan slur hounds that he named Drunkard, Taster, Tippler, and Tipsy. That's they fantastic. They sound like if Santa's reindeer were all alcoholics, which would be a shame because Rudolph's red nose would no longer be of note. John Adams had three dogs that presumably spanned the alignment chart, being named Juno, Mark, and Satan respectively. Not a <laughs> He had a dog named Satan. That's fantastic. I love it. Jefferson kept around 40 sheep during his presidency, one, killed a one person. of which was a four-horned Shetland ram. Though nameless, said ram soon became famous for killing a young boy on White House grounds. Rather than immediately destroying the animal as we'd expect today, Jefferson just had it moved back to Monticello. It was eventually put down, but only after it single-handedly killed several other rams at the estate, which just goes to show how Jefferson operated. Random child... Yeah. Think about that. Think about that. A presidential pet killed a kid 
and they just sent him back to Monticello. Well, not the best optics, but that can be forgiven. But my own property? That's a bridge too far, Rambo. John Quincy Adams' wife Louisa practiced sericulture, which is a fun word for silkworm keeping. As a side... And Louisa is one of our, I think, two foreign-born first ladies, along with Melania Trump. Uh, she was born in, in England. Now, sericulture has been going on since at least 3630 BC, which is kind of nutty, because that means we domesticated worms to turn their goo into clothes before we figured out how to ride a horse. Jackson had an African gray parrot named there Paul, short for Polly, that would apparently curse like a sailor, probably thanks to the teachings of Old Hickory himself. Having outlived its owner, Paul ended up being removed from Jackson's funeral service after unleashing so much profanity that guests found it genuinely upsetting. He also kept... That is so in keeping with Andrew Jackson. I'm working on my own original video where I'm going to talk about my favorite uh, random facts about each of the presidents. Uh, and that is definitely going to be one for Andrew Jackson as this parrot that was swearing so bad at his funeral it had to be removed. But it's uh, when you think of presidents, like if I were to say what president probably had a parrot that swore so much it had to be removed. It seems to me Andrew Jackson would probably be at the top of my list of who that would be. Roosters for cockfighting, which was acceptable at the time and still far from the worst thing he's done morally. During Van Absolutely. Buren's term, the Sultan of Oman sent a variety of gifts to the president, among them being a pair of tiger cubs. He was like, this is badass, and desperately wanted to keep them in the White House. But the dickheads in Congress asserted that, due to a specific constitutional provision, gifts to the presidential office weren't for the man himself, but for yeah. the people. Van Buren said, fuck the people them's my tigers and got into a legal them's battle. my tigers <laughs> that's true though it's it's very highly regulated uh, i mean there's a lot of such rules like that because you got to figure every single time a president meets like a dignitary from another country they're probably going to bring a gift of some kind and there's been a lot made of some of the gifts over years that have either been given or received by a president uh and what it says about those people Battle with the legislator over the issue, which he eventually lost. The tigers were subsequently sent to a zoo, and over 20 years later, Van Buren died of pneumonia, completely unrelated to this incident. Although Andrew Johnson had no du jour pets, he did befriend a family of mice he found in his bedroom, feeding them flour and grain and referring to them as the little fellows. It's an oddly wholesome thing to hear from someone who essentially set the trajectory for the next 100 years of black disenfranchisement. Mr. 100%. Thank you, Salmonella, for pointing that out. It's why Andrew Johnson Andrew Johnson might be my, he might be my least favorite president. No, he is my least favorite president, not named Thomas. Johnson, we still have a uh, country to rebuild. Get out of my room, I'm getting rat-pilled. Taft had two cows during his term. The first of them was named Mooly Wooly, and she died a year and a half in after, quote, eating too many oats. Mooly was promptly replaced by the far more dignified Pauline Wayne. She was a real dime of a heifer, which led Taft to show her off at the International Dairy Men's Expo in Milwaukee. In order to get her there, she was transported in a private car attached to a train headed for the stockyards in Chicago. But a switch crew mixed up which car was hers, oh, leading no. to two days of frantic telegraphs asking where the president's she cow had slaughter. gone. She only narrowly avoided well. the slaughterhouse when a couple of attendants at the stockyard recognized Pauline for what she was, and all was well. The Impressive that they would have recognized her. They probably wondered why is this random cow on its own cart. This one requires a little background info. So the traditional Thanksgiving dinner was and remains a significant yearly ceremony for the first family. So who do we have here? We've got Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. We've got Gerald Ford, Bill Clinton, and his daughter Chelsea and wife. Uh, uh, Hillary, we've got, I have no idea who that is, but it doesn't look like one of the presidents. Uh, we've got Eisenhower here, George W. Bush, and Donald Trump. For half a century, from 1873 to 1913, the duty of providing the presidential turkey belonged to one Horace Vose, a private turkey farmer based in Rhode Island. After his death, though, things turned into a free-for-all, with numerous farmers sending unsolicited turkeys, both alive and dead, in an <laughs> Jive turkeys. I don't know if that's a reference to the movie Airplane or not, but... There's an iconic scene in that movie. If you haven't seen it, it's hilarious. ...attempt to secure a position as the next annual caterer for the White House. Nobody was decided on for a decade. And upon assuming office in 1923, Calvin Coolidge found the volume of birds showing up at his doorstep alarming and put an end to the tradition that year, instead opting to buy his own turkey. But in 1920... But that fits totally with Calvin Coolidge. Calvin Coolidge might be our last president that truly had a very... 
I don't know what the word you would use would be, but uh, a very strong view of the presidency as do no harm kind of thing. Like basically a caretaker rather than an active, you know, Theodore Roosevelt very famous, famously said that being president meant that you had a bully pulpit. You had this inherent influence and power that came with the office that you should wield accordingly. And Calvin Coolidge was the exact opposite of that. He was like hands off whenever possible. And so it makes sense that he ended that tradition and went out and just got his own turkey. Five, after much outside pressure, he caved and was immediately flooded with not only turkey, but a variety of increasingly exotic animals to eat. Among them was a live raccoon he received the following year. Coolidge was, at the time, blissfully unaware of the intricate dance performed on the palate between forward yet ephemeral gaminess and heady seductive musk when one submits himself to the experience of a toothsome raccoon fillet, and as such, he decided to keep it as a pet instead. Dubbed Rebecca, the creature soon came to be a core member of the Coolidge family. Rebecca. She ate as well as any of them, being fed things like shrimp and persimmons, and she was particularly fond of eggs. Given free reign over the house, Rebecca's hobbies reportedly included unscrewing light bulbs, uprooting houseplants, and playing with wet bars of soap in the back. That's fantastic! Could you imagine visiting the Coolidge White House in the 1920s and just randomly watching a raccoon named Rebecca scurry by as you were on your way to see the president bathtub she was so beloved that she even had her own treehouse built for her in the white house yard when the coolidges made way for the hoovers rebecca was forced to vacate her post but the new first family soon found that they had a squatter on their hands the new tenant of rebecca's treehouse was a wild opossum who rather than being evicted was adopted by the hoovers in a similar fashion to rebecca albeit from a farther distance mostly just saying yeah that's ours now he was given the name billy possum which is a reference to our old friend taft see as the man following teddy roosevelt in the white house Taft had some big shoes to fill. So during his term, some enterprising young dumbasses approached Taft with what they claimed would be the sequel to the teddy bear. They called it Billy Possum, which is what? itself a reference to the president's fondness of possum and taters, a dish he famously requested at a banquet in Atlanta as an act. Ohio into President Taft, we do not make it a habit of eating possum and taters here in Ohio. In fact, this is the first I'm hearing of that being a dish. Definitely not a thing here. ...of goodwill towards the South and its culture. Taft found the idea amusing enough that he gave the green light, and many thousands of Billy Possums were produced. Given I do get it, though. I get why they would want to take advantage of uh, the, the idea of a president being associated with a, a stuffed animal because of the teddy bear, which is named in honor of Theodore Roosevelt, even though he hated the name Teddy their total obscurity today, it's clear these toys were a massive flop, and there's a few reasons for that. For one, trying to force fads at all is like trying to push water uphill. But also, the story of Roosevelt refusing to shoot a tied-up bear has a bit more symbolic poetry to it than, it's a possum, cause he like possum, he a fat boy, eat him up good. Couple that with the constant character assassination that the opossum as an animal has received from ignorant urbanites, and it becomes obvious that this thing was doomed from the start. But anyway, that's where the Hoover opossum got his name, and his exploits were pretty limited outside of temporarily filling in as a mascot of a local high school. Wow. In 1961, Soviet Premier Kennedy. Nikita Khrushchev gifted a dog to the Kennedys named Pushinka, or Fluffy. And while it is normally rude to look a gift dog in the mouth, an exception can be made when the single biggest threat to the free world insists that said dog should live with the president. Pushinka was actually- Yeah, and that's one of the other things you have to think about in all this is with these gifts, especially with a gift like a live animal, is the cultural sensitivities at play here. Uh, so I don't want to give anything away because I don't want to get this person in trouble, but a family member, uh, works at a hospital and had a very famous, uh, patient who was very wealthy and, uh, was from a foreign country and gave gifts to everyone who had treated this patient. And normally you wouldn't be allowed to accept gifts, but because of the cultural sensitivities involved in this particular case, they were allowed to accept those gifts. Uh, so, you know, you have to think about all of those sorts of things. Afraid, put through metal detectors, and given ultrasounds out of fear that someone implanted her with a listening device. That's totally Fortunately, understandable. though there may be bugs in some of you mugs, there ain't no bugs in she. And Pushinka remained a Kennedy for the rest of her days. While truthfully, the gift was likely given as a simple act of good faith designed to reduce Cold War tensions, Pushinka was also the daughter of Strelka, who, during Sputnik 5, became the first mammal to make it back from space alive. So oh. I'd like to think of it as more of a passive-aggressive space race flex. Like, yeah, our astronaut animals are so alive, they're making 
making babies even. Hope looking at this one constantly reminds you of where you stand. With that, I hope you found this highlight makes real sense. enlightening. It feels good to know that while Congress has always been a zoo, so too has the White House at times. That's all for today. Till <laughs> Great job, as always, Salmonella. I love his style. I love the information that he gives and the humor. Uh, and I think he do, a lot of people do as well because this video is 24 hours in, already hitting like 2 million views. So uh, if you like that, you'll definitely like his channel. And he's got some really, really interesting stories that he tells. I would point you toward Tarare is probably one of his best. Uh, but also the one about uh, President Garfield's assassin, Charles Gateau, is really, really good as well. So those are a couple I'd recommend if you haven't already checked them out. I have done reactions to both of those as well. So let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below if you've got a suggestion of something you'd like me to check out. I'd be glad to do that. Just put, uh, put it in the description or send me a link. Um, if you do post a link, just keep in mind that I'll have to approve that uh, before it shows up. So don't think that I'm deleting your posts or anything like that. So thanks for watching. See you again soon.